Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to another edition of uh, a live stream from the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. For those of you that don't know, my name is John Lustria. I'm the Director of Education here at the museum, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by our Membership and Development Coordinator, Kyle Dalton. Thanks for joining us today, Kyle. Always good to be here. Uh, I, I say thanks for joining us, but uh, I made you be here. <laughs> but <laughs> it was uh, anyway. it was mutually agreed upon. Yes, no, you're right. Uh, so I'm glad everybody's happy to be here. I hope you all watching us today are are happy to be here as well. Um, I think we're going to have a really good and exciting conversation based on uh, some research Kyle has done about uh, unanesthetized un surgeries, if that's uh, the right way to, to phrase that, surgeries without anesthesia during the Civil War, which were much more uncommon than you might think, uh, although some of our veteran viewers uh, probably know better than to, uh, to think that that was uh, to, to know that that was uncommon. Uh, anyway, before we jump into that, um, we're just going to say, uh, if you like our videos, go ahead and hit the like button, share them, tell your friends, post them in any civil war or medical groups you're in or groups where it's totally unrelated. Uh, always good to spread the word. That's an easy, free way that anyone that likes our videos uh, can support us. Uh, if you want to take your support to the next level, consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Your membership dollars support programming like this and allow us to continue to do what we do. So if you've enjoyed our videos at any point over the last few years or you plan to continue enjoying them in the future, becoming a member is a great way to support that. For as little as $25 a year, that's just couple dollars a month. Uh, you pay more for that uh, for Netflix or, or Hulu or whatever other streaming deal you use. Uh, so uh, consider if you're able throwing a few dollars our way. Uh, it really, really helps us out. And you get some uh, really cool benefits off of it too. You get free admission to the museum for a full year. Uh, you get discounts in our gift shop for cool merchandise like uh, this, this coffee mug that I've been drinking uh, too much coffee from. Uh, there's all kinds of great benefits because uh, so, we like to thank you for supporting us. It really is uh, the reason that we're able to do what we do. So please consider that if you like these videos. Yes, uh, absolutely. And, and Kyle, uh, you'll get to know Kyle quite well. Uh, as I mentioned, he is our <laughs> membership and development coordinator. You'll receive some nice letters and, and journals and publications and phone calls and all manner of good stuff uh, from Kyle himself. So um, with all that said, I see we've already got a good number of folks tuning in. We got Gary from Ellicott City, Maryland, Jan from sunny and warm Orlando, Florida. I'm a little bit jealous. Uh, we're in the throes of winter uh, here at the museum, although it uh, has been warm enough that it's been raining as opposed to snowing. So that's a, a nice change. With all that said, uh, we'll go ahead and jump in now, Kyle, to uh, our main topic of conversation here. Uh, which is about anesthesia in the Civil War and the rare instances where there wasn't any. Uh, so why don't we get things started? Uh, you're, you're our resident anesthesia expert here at the museum. Uh, but importantly, uh, and I want to make this clear to our audience too, I am not an anesthesiologist. Both of us are historians. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about medical history, but nothing we're saying it should be taken as medical advice. We're not uh, medical professionals, we're historians. So just want to make that clear before we get too far into it. Yes, very important distinction to make. Um, maybe get us started, Kyle, by bringing us all back up to speed. Maybe some of our viewers might be familiar with this, but just get everyone up to speed. You know, what are we talking about as far as anesthesia? What was being used? When was it kind of discovered? And how, you know, widespread was the acceptance of anesthesia by the time the Civil War rolled around? So uh, anesthesia, uh, first we'll, we'll um, define that. Anesthesia is the state. Um, anesthesia is when you are uh, experiencing three things, ideally three things. Analgesia, analgesia is pain relief. Amnesia, uh, in inability to form memories. Uh, and uh, muscle relaxation. Uh, anesthesia should give you all three of those things uh, if it's general anesthesia. General anesthesia is you are knocked out. Uh, you are, are incapacitated, you cannot move, you, you can't react, and you don't feel pain. 
There's also local anesthesia. We're going to be talking about general anesthesia here. There was some form of local anesthesia uh, in the Civil War, but it's a, a whole different topic. And generally in the Civil War, when they say anesthesia, they mean general anesthesia. Uh, so that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, so anesthesia is the state. That's, that's when you're knocked out. That's when you're incapacitated. You're experiencing analgesia, amnesia, and muscle relaxation. Um, it's administered through anesthetic agents. The anesthetic agents are the chemicals that induce the state of anesthesia. Uh, these in this period are ether, uh, diethyl ether, and chloroform. Uh, those are the two big ones. Uh, you also asked when it started. Uh, it started in 1846 uh, is when it was first like made really public. Uh, we try to avoid using the term invented when we're talking about a lot of uh, medical things. Um, because in scientific history, uh, it's really less about creating something and more about discovering something that already exists. Uh, germ theory, for example, we did a video on germ theory a while back. And in that video, I said, you know, whether or not you believe in germs, they're there. Whether or not you know about germs, they're still present. It's just they have to be discovered. Uh, same kind of thing with anesthesia, uh, that these agents would induce uh, anesthesia, regardless of whether or not we knew that they did that. Uh, so it experiences uh, a sort of co-discovery. Uh, this is a, a thing that happens all the time in scientific history, uh, where we've just about gotten the knowledge and the technology to a certain point where it's the ground is ripe for discovery. Uh, and all of a sudden, a bunch of people will realize it all at once, disparate parts of the world, uh, without even communicating to each other. Um, chloroform, for example, was co-discovered by three separate people in Europe and North America, all in 1833. Uh, so it was just ready. They weren't talking to each other. They weren't communicating. Just the science was there, and it just happened. Uh, and it's kind of the same thing with general anesthesia. Uh, in the 1840s, you start seeing American doctors discovering general anesthesia. Um, the first one is Crawford W. Long uh, down uh, in the South, but he doesn't share his discovery with basically anybody. Uh, so it really has no effect on the larger world. He knows it works, but it doesn't do anybody else any good. Um, the next one up was uh, a dentist uh, from New England, um, and he unfortunately botched his demonstration. He went to the Massachusetts General Hospital uh, and tried to demonstrate it, uh, but he didn't get his patient uh, far enough under, and his patient started phonotating. He started making noise, and he started having um, muscle movement, involuntary muscle movement. His patient still experienced analgesia and amnesia. After the fact, he said, I didn't feel anything, but it didn't matter. The appearance was that he failed. Uh, so that just fell off the face of the earth as well. Finally, 1846, October 1846, William Thomas Green Morton, WTG Morton, uh, he's also a dentist. Uh, he does the first successful public demonstration of general anesthesia using diethyl ether. Uh, a patient has a neck tumor removed uh, in the Massachusetts General Hospital in a surgical theater with dozens of medical professionals present. Uh, this is the watershed moment. This is when everybody realizes, uh, in the words of uh, one medical professional, this is no humbug. Uh, that this is a thing that works. Uh, and uh, it spreads rapidly from there. Uh, as you say, how are people, uh, that question you asked about, how do people react to this? Um, most doctors appear to be pretty open to it, but there is some trepidation. There's a lot of fear about how exactly this works. Uh, and very rapidly, they realize uh, that it doesn't take very much to overdose a patient. Uh, they don't really have a guide for how to administer anesthesia. Uh, and so if you're, uh, a, if you're female, if you're younger, uh, if you are underweight, uh, you should be receiving a lower dosage than an adult, um, well, uh, fortified male. Uh, but they don't really adjust for that at first. They're trying to figure it out. Uh, and, and they do start to have some overdose deaths. So that's part of the trepidation is that, uh, we gotta be real careful about this we can absolutely overdose our patients. Um, but there's also some suspicion that it might cause hemorrhage, uh, that it would prevent separation. Uh, that's, that's healing of wounds. Um, there's all sorts of other concerns that don't really have a scientific basis, but a surgeon might see that several other patients has the same condition and the connection they see is the general anesthesia. And so they blame the anesthesia uh, rather than whatever else it is that's causing it. Uh, and that gives rise to 
not exactly conspiracy theories, but a misunderstanding of what anesthesia could do. Uh, so early on, there is some, um, some reluctance from parts of the medical community, but pretty quickly, uh, especially for a new innovation like, like this, it's overcome. Uh, by the 1850s, uh, it's widely accepted. There are very few holdouts who say that, that we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, by the Civil War, basically no doctor is saying that you shouldn't do general anesthesia. It is, you are a quack if you believe that by the 1860s. Yeah, that's uh, kind of interesting that it was, um, e even though there was some uh, confusion maybe about the exact method by which it worked, it is in some ways kind of amazing that it was as accepted as it was pretty much from the get-go. Um, I guess uh, you can't argue with success uh, or something like that. Uh, and I love the phrase, this is no humbug. Uh, yes. instead, instead of saying the hype is real, I think I'm just going to start saying this is no humbug. <laughs> we'll have to come up with more uh, Victorian slang terms to replace modern ones. Uh. <laughs> exactly. So I, I'm going to try and start using that in my, in my regular life. Oh, this is no humbug, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, as a reminder to folks watching, uh, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to put them in the comments. Uh, and we got a couple of good comments already. One from one of our longtime viewers, uh, Eddie McDevitt. Uh, he says, uh, during the horrific earthquake in Haiti, sadly, many operations had to be done with little or no anesthesia. Happily, this was rare in the Civil War, as I assume we will hear from Kyle, and we certainly will, uh, upwards of, and we'll get into some more exact numbers in a minute, uh, upwards of 95% uh, of reported surgeries uh, did use anesthesia, but we're going to highlight some of the cases that didn't. Um, and to get to a, a question that, that we got, one from Jan. Uh, Jan asks, why did it become the myth that most Civil War surgeries were done without anesthesia? I think that's that's definitely a part of this conversation, why that is so pervasive that people think there wasn't any anesthesia. Do you want to speak to that a little bit, Kyle? Sure. Um, so the short answer, uh, there's, there is no short answer. Okay. <laughs> so the uh, there's a couple of reasons. The first is that this myth cropped up almost immediately. Um, this was bound with the idea of the surgeon as a sawbones. Um, what we mean by that is the surgeon is a butcher, as someone who delights in amputations, uh, somebody who is at some level a quack, uh, who is unqualified. Uh, and there, it's not that there's no basis for that. Um, we actually are rewriting some exhibit panels uh, for our, our museum. And one of them is looking at the boards of examination. Uh, this, these boards are the ones that decided whether a doctor could be taken into the army. And if he um, is accused of malpractice, they're the ones who examine that surgeon and determine if he should stay in the army. Uh, and uh, at the beginning of the war, the boards of examination only apply for um, federal regiments. Uh, if you are a volunteer regiment, uh, then, then you are not subject to a board of examination. Uh, your colonel can just appoint whoever he wants to be the surgeon, the assistant surgeon, so on and so forth. Uh, so there's a lot of guys who get in who have uh, no barrier to entry. Um, and sometimes they are, in the words of, of one Confederate newspaper, crossroads doctors. Uh, these guys are closer to apothecaries. Uh, they're just selling drugs and occasionally doing the work that they need to do, but they may not have any experience in trauma care. Uh, they may not have even gone to med school. Uh, and that creates a problem. There are some doctors who are unfit. Uh, now, this doesn't make up the majority of Civil War surgeons, and by 1863, both sides have boards of examination that are in constant operation. So it's really the beginning of the war where this is a problem, and it's not most surgeons, but it does exist. Uh, and that gets coupled with a misunderstanding of how anesthesia works. Uh, this is very common at the time. Uh, not unlike today, how many movies have you seen where somebody puts a cloth rag over somebody's mouth and knocks them out? Uh, which, if that's chloroform, you just killed that person. They're, they're definitely dead. Uh, that's not how anesthesia works. But it's the same sort of thing back then. Um, there's a soldier in the uh, Rhode Island Heavy Artillery who writes in, in his journal about how um, his battery was stopped uh, alongside ambulance wagons, and they could smell what they believed to be um, the etherized patients, uh, the anesthetized patients. And the, the soldiers of the battery 
were getting really nervous. And they're like, we need to get moving. Like, I don't know what this is going to do to us. We can smell it. Are we all going to just like overdose and die right here on the road? Like, that's not how any of that works. But there is a misunderstanding generally of how anesthesia works in the period. Uh, and so uh, when you see a patient who is uh, phonotating, who is making noise, who's moving in the early stages of anesthesia, even if it's before a surgery is occurring, you can get the impression that that guy has not actually had any anesthesia, uh, that it's the trauma that has knocked him out, uh, and he's still actually somewhat conscious and aware of what's going on. That's also not totally off the rails, uh, even though that, that may not be a perfectly accurate picture. We know that a lot of patients were underdosed. Uh, there is no classification system at the time. Uh, the first system for classification of uh, anesthesia for knowing how deep uh, someone is into the process uh, is a Goodell uh, classification in 1938. So we are many decades away from an understanding of how exactly this works uh, and how to judge how deep your patient is into it. Uh, and so a lot of times they are underdosing because they're worried about overdosing. Uh, they'd rather their patient remember a little bit of what's going on, but not feel the pain than overdose and kill their patient. Uh, so there is a lot of guesswork going on. So there is a factual basis for why people thought that anesthesia was less widely used than it was. Having said all of that, the bigger issue is Hollywood. That's basically what it comes down to. Uh, I know I've mentioned this book to, to you before, John. Uh, I, I don't know if I brought it up on a live stream. Gary Gallagher wrote a great book called uh, Causes One Lost and Forgotten. Uh, and it's an examination of civil war as portrayed in film from birth of a nation uh, all the way into the 2000s. Uh, and in that, he, he does a very good job of arguing that uh, our perception of history, and this is not confined to the Civil War, there's a lot of historians who recognize this, our understanding of history is widely defined by what gets on film, uh, and that's above any other medium books, whatever historians can do in lecture format, like we're doing here or whatever, Hollywood is always going to have a wider reach than that. Uh, and historical films have this kind of melange where like everything old timey is kind of crammed together, uh, where it's this under this understanding of history is very much like, well, it all happened back then, right? So it's all kind of the same. Um, and that means that there are a lot of tropes in historical fiction that may be appropriate for, say, the revolution well before general anesthesia is a thing, but are not appropriate for the Civil War. And it continues well beyond that. Uh, Outlander, famously a historical Outlander, has a scene in World War II where surgeries are being done without anesthesia. That is absolutely not happening for British forces behind the lines. Just not, not occurring. Uh, and so Civil War has the same thing. Anytime there's a surgery scene in the Civil War, it's always unanesthetized. And you may not have a deep knowledge of Civil War medicine. Most people don't. Uh, it is a fairly niche topic. I think we know that. Uh, but you will have sort of absorbed from the culture that that is the thing that happens. Uh, so again, there is a factual basis there, but the bigger issue is popular culture. Uh, Hollywood has tropes. They use those tropes over and over again. Uh, and that particular trope is inaccurate. Yeah, you're, you're right to point, Kyle. To It's almost sort of like a two-pronged kind of thing. There is the, the kind of underlying kind of misunderstanding that does happen in real time during the Civil War that you know, gets carried on. And then of course, there's the filmmakers that come in that kind of let, you know, build upon that foundation as it were. I mean, it's a, the way I phrase it there makes it sound like you know, everyone was in cahoots. It wasn't quite like that, but, right, but yeah. <laughs> but when you, when you zoom out and you look at it as you kind of laid it out, Kyle, you can kind of see how that starts building on each other. And then suddenly you know, there's decades of uh, kind of misunderstanding that uh, you and I get to continually work to uh, try, and, uh, try and take yeah. down. Um, and I don't want to so. be too condemnatory either. Like the, these um, stories are often very good. I enjoy movies. Uh, you know, they're, they're trying to serve a point with that plot. They're not throwing it in there to be like, yeah, this is really going to mess with those Civil War medicine guys. Uh, they're, they're trying to accomplish something. Uh, and uh, there, there is a movie coming out uh, soon that I'm not yet at liberty to talk about uh, that may be doing something a little different with that. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, keep, keep an eye out for popular culture Civil War stuff. Ooh, very mysterious. <laughs> um, popping over to the comments real quick. Uh, this is sort of tangentially related to what we were just talking about. 
Um, Anne asked how many doctors had actually done a major sur surgery prior to the Civil War. And this is interesting, I think, especially as it relates to uh, the conversation about anesthesia. I mean, you know, I, I'll, I'll just say quickly that very few doctors had treated bullet wounds before the Civil War. Um, so that's worth noting. But while anesthesia was pretty widely accepted in the medical community going into the Civil War, how many doctors had actually used it on a regular basis in surgery? I, I, can you speak to that? A little bit. Um, I don't have solid numbers for like, like exactly how many used it, but definitely a minority. Uh, there's not that many, there's not that much of a call in most communities in the United States for trauma care. Uh, there's the, the nation is not as well armed as we often imagine it to be. Um, there's a reason that uh, in the run up to the Civil War following um, John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry, the South militarizes uh, and buys guns and ammunition and tries to train people because it is not as well armed a society as we imagine it to be. Um, gun ownership is lower than a lot of people imagine uh, for the antebellum period. Uh, so first of all, there's that. Uh, there's, there's not as much violence as we often imagine. Not to say that there's no violence, it's just not as common as we imagine. It's not the Wild West. Uh, there's also uh, a higher life expectancy than we often imagine for this period. There are farming accidents, to be sure, um, but most people don't die that way. Most people don't experience those things. Uh, it's just not that common to have trauma care. And this is reflected in the survivability of these surgeries. The surgeons are generally ex inexperienced in trauma care uh, and just don't have a lot of opportunity to practice that uh, with a few exceptions. As you said, most doctors had not treated a gunshot wound before the Civil War. Uh, nine out of every 10 army doctors had not treated a gun. And those are army doctors. Those guys are around guns. <laughs> Nine out of every 10 army doctors had not treated a gunshot wound before the war. Um, trauma care was, relatively speaking, rare. Uh, and so they didn't have a lot of experience with it. That's, of course, there's other conditions. Uh, there's uh, tumor removal. Um, even there was some experimentation with dentistry. Uh, William Thomas Green Morton, uh, WTG Morton, the guy who introduced anesthesia to the world, was a dentist by trade. Uh, so you do have it for also some more mundane things. But you're more likely to see that uh, in urban areas. It's also important to note that there are very few people who are just anesthesiologists. Uh, it is almost entirely um, doctors who have other uh, specialties. Uh, they are surgeons in the general term, not in the term that we use today. Uh, there's less specificity. Surgeons are also anesthesiologists. Uh, so again, the experience there isn't super great before the Civil War. Uh, and this again is reflected in um, the survivability of uh, amputations. Amputations are far fewer before the war. And uh, in the UK and the United States, it's a 50% mortality rate before the war. Uh, by the end of the war, it drops to 10 to 13%, uh, relatively comparable to what it is today. Uh, so uh, you're seeing a, a lot of inexperience before the war. Uh, not that many people really knew how to do it. And the war gave them the experience. And it's worth noting as well that you, you mentioned, Kyle, that there was uh, there's pretty strong evidence for um, underdosing during the Civil War of anesthesia. I think that caution comes from a lack of experience. There's just uh, not quite as pervasive a knowledge of you know, not, not as intimate of a knowledge of, you know, how it works. And so hence the underdosing, better be safe than sorry, uh, better have a little bit of pain than death, um, if, uh, you know, by the hand of the surgeon that is. Uh, but that's, that's a really interesting question, I think, uh, you know, how many surgeons had actually had experience with anesthesia going into the war. Of course, they get a lot of experience uh, during the war. Uh, and then one uh, final question from the comments uh, before we kind of start getting specific here. Um, well, uh, quickly, Elizabeth asked uh, if we could um, write down the name of that book that you just mentioned, Kyle. I, I put it in the yeah. comments, but just to say it out loud again, it's Causes One Lost and Forgotten by Gary Gallagher. Really interesting read. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a good book. It's short uh, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good read and a quick one. Um, which you, you can't say about all Civil War books. <laughs> uh, James asks, uh, how much knowledge of trauma care and wounds carried over from the Mexican War, uh, if any? Not a lot. There definitely were surgeons who were veterans of the Mexican War who saw combat 
uh, or rather saw combat casualties uh, and continued to, um, to serve into the Civil War. But the scale of the Mexican War uh, and Mexican War combat specifically uh, is much smaller than the American Civil War. Uh, far fewer casualties by percentage of, of enlisted men. Um, so those few surgeons who did, some of them did retire between the wars. Uh, it, it is 15 years uh, difference. Uh, so there's unfortunately not a lot of experience coming. There is a lot of knowledge though. Uh, and this is also true of European conflicts. Uh, there are numerous American surgeons uh, who opine on and even witness the Crimean War in the 1850s. Uh, so they are passing the knowledge on, but the hands-on experience is pretty rare. Yes, uh, that that's my understanding as well. And again, just to further underscore, they develop quite a bit of experience pretty darn quickly. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's also important to note that the Mexican War, it, it is during the Mexican War that general anesthesia is discovered and, and publicly shared. The war begins in April 1846. Uh, Morton's demonstration is October 1846. Uh, so even though it pretty rapidly translates to the army and they begin using it almost immediately, um, there is still that very early stage. There are some surgeons who ban it from their hospitals, uh, who don't understand it and, and don't want to experiment on their soldiers. Uh, and I think that's an understandable impulse, but it does mean that there is less experience, even within the Mexican War, uh, than, than you would get in comparable conflicts. That's a great point. Now, to get into uh, some of your, your latest research, uh, again, anesthesia was so pervasive during the Civil War, 95 plus percent uh, surgeries were, were done with it. But you were looking specifically into that very small number that didn't use anesthesia. Um, you know, in what you've uncovered, uh, did you identify any commonalities between these procedures? A any, talk about what you found and uh, what kinds of procedures and what they were like and how they were described and, and all that, all that. Sure. Um, so as you say, it is a minute number. Um, now we say 95 plus percent, uh, that leaves a lot of room uh, because we know the numbers for the North, but we don't know the numbers for the Confederacy. Uh, for the North, uh, infinitesimal. Uh, I think it's 264 surgeries are conducted without anesthesia among um, the Northern uh, procedures. This is out of at least 80,000 procedures. Uh, okay. That is a and, and quickly, quickly on on the point of the numbers there as well. Uh, these are recorded surgeries. Uh, yes, I, I don't think that the number of uh, that, that there's a dramatically there's a, a large number of unrecorded surgeries, but it's not yes. <laughs> the one hundred percent complete full picture is pretty darn right. close. Uh, but just yes. quickly worth noting in that regard. And as you're about to elaborate, uh, we have very little as it relates to the Confederacy. So we can't right. be as specific as, you know, maybe we'd want to be, but we can be awfully specific. And anyway, I yeah. just wanted to make that point real quick. No, and that is important uh, that we have to know where our boundaries are here when talking about this, especially when you're talking about what are clearly fringe cases. If they are that far outside the norm, if they are that minute, uh, it means that any change can really throw off how we understand how it works. Uh, so we're talking 260 some surgeries out of at least 80,000 uh, among US forces uh, that were done without anesthesia. Um, there are legitimate reasons for performing a surgery without anesthesia, uh, especially general anesthesia. Um, again, there's, there is some form of local anesthesia. There's a few surgeons who write about um, pouring opium powder on pen knives and dashing it over a wound uh, as like a local anesthetic. Um, but generally, when they say anesthesia, they mean general anesthesia. Um, so there's a couple of reasons you might not do that. The first is anesthesia affects breathing it affects the heart rate. Uh, in the second phase of anesthesia, um, you experience a, a rapid heartbeat over 100 uh, beats per minute. Uh, you're, you can experience vomiting 
Uh, that's one of the reasons that even today they say don't eat breakfast if you're going in for a surgery. Uh, they really mean that because that can be deadly even today. Don't if your surgeon tells you that, don't do that. Uh, I know we said not to give medical advice, but listen to your doctor. <laughs> um, and this is true of the period as well. Uh, again, this is going to be true regardless of cultural or historical understanding. Um, these are the effects it has on the body. Uh, so if you're dealing with a throat, lung, or mouth injury, uh, if you're going to be operating on that, you can't use anesthesia. Uh, it interferes with the air passage, uh, with, the, with the breathing passageways. There are legitimate medical reasons to not do it. Uh, we have an account by um, Lieutenant Dawes of the... I'm going to have to look that up. He's a Union officer. Uh, he gets uh, his jaw shattered uh, at the Battle of Dallas in Georgia, uh, not Texas. And he has to undergo a reconstructive surgery of the jaw. And it's an hour and a half long. Uh, and that means that he can't have anesthesia. It's, it's the jaw. Uh, the other side of that is that they'd have to constantly readminister. Uh, the average amount of time that a patient spent under during the Civil War was under 20 minutes. I think it was 17 minutes altogether, but it depends on the anesthetic agent. So they would have had to give this guy uh, an anesthetic agent every like 20 minutes for an hour and a half while they're reconstructing his jaw. Uh, that is just an unacceptable risk. Uh, so there are surgeries where it is, um, it, it's necessary to not give general anesthesia. So that might account for some of those cases. There is also speculation by the compilers of this data, the authors and editors of the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. Uh, and in that they speculate that this could be kind of a carryover from those Mexican war and uh, early antebellum ideas of what anesthesia could do. A fear that it would cause hemorrhaging, a fear that it would prevent suppuration, uh, a fear that it would do things that the science didn't really support. Uh, so it could be that those fringe cases could be explained by that, but the surgeons who conducted those didn't actually report why they did it. Uh, so for, for that, we can, we can say for the North uh, that it's not a supply issue that it is a personal choice by the surgeons. It may be motivated by pseudoscience, uh, a, a wrong belief in what anesthesia can do and what the side effects are. Uh, it may also be practical, that these are surgeries in which you shouldn't be using anesthesia anyway. Um, but we really don't know. We just know that they're fringe cases and the surgeons themselves do, didn't say why. It's a different situation for the Confederacy. Yeah, and I wondered if you might talk about uh, instances where uh, supply was lacking. Now, certainly the Confederacy would run into, you know, similar situations where it's inadvisable to do it, you know, for medical reasons, uh, you know, with the breathing and such. But you mentioned supply, supply chain issues uh, wasn't a problem for Union surgeons. Was it for Confederate surgeons? Uh, so the, yeah, definitely not a problem for the North, um, for United States surgeons, um, the, uh, amount of anesthetic agent that was available was staggering. Uh, there was enough to administer 880,000 doses, uh, at just one point in the war. Uh, they are churning them out like crazy. Uh, it is very widely available. There's no, ex there's no supply excuse to not use general anesthesia if you can. Um, the South, again, much more hard strap, but they still have it. There's, uh, as we said, this is still a fringe case. Uh, the um, surgeon, John Julian Chisholm, claims that he saw 10,000 surgeries with anesthetic agent through the course of the war. Uh, Dr. Hunter Holmes McGuire, who's a core surgeon, uh, he's uh, Stonewall Jackson's chief surgeon. He sees 28,000 by the end of the war. These are two doctors in just two corps in one army. So we're talking again about staggering numbers. They absolutely do have enough for most of the war. But that's not to say that it's something they can be slapdash with. Um, many surgeons after the war will say something like, you know, we couldn't be picky. If it smelled a little funky, if we weren't totally sure, if we wanted a different brand, well, that's too bad. This is what we got. This is what you have to use. There's nothing more than this. Um, so there's there's certainly enough, but it's just enough. And there are moments where it crosses over into not enough. And specifically, I think uh, both of our in both of our researches, we have uncovered 
not not many, but we have uncovered a few instances during the seven days campaigns, with uh, seven days battles, uh, which is in the you know the earlier part of the war, the summer of 1862, where they uh, where they did run out uh, in uh, of anesthesia, and we theorized that maybe, and we should know this is some degree of speculation on our part, but we theorized that you know maybe this really kind of spooked them, and and it's worth noting too that the seven days battles are, uh, there had been other sizable battles before that, notably the Battle of Shiloh in Tennessee and uh, uh, the Battle of Fair Oaks or Seven Pines, which took place about a month before Seven Days Battles. But those battles in 1862, the, those first major battles, which where we see casualties go from a few thousand to tens of thousands, suddenly the scale ramps up pretty dramatically. And we theorize that maybe this uh, kind of put the fear of God in, in uh, both Union and Confederates uh, from the degree of the sheer amount of medical supplies that might be required, notably anesthesia. So Kyle, um, can you speak to some of the, the efforts that they took, both sides took to ensure that they were well supplied? Yeah, and these efforts do start before uh, the, the Seven Days Battles. Uh, so the Confederacy, for example, establishes, I think, 13 laboratories stretching from uh, Virginia to Georgia to Texas. Uh, and these laboratories are churning out anesthetic agent as quickly as they can, chloroform and ether. Uh, and only one of these laboratories had been constructed before the seven days. Uh, within the year following the seven days, the next 12 were constructed and operating. Um, now, again, it's unclear whether these had all been planned beforehand or if the seven days kicked things into high gear where the Confederacy realized, oh, we don't have enough. We need to start like really churning them out. Uh, and it is worth noting that the Seven Days Battles, though tremendous, tens of thousands of casualties, uh, is also not the biggest set of battles in the war. Uh, we don't see the same lack at uh, Antietam or Gettysburg, um, despite, again, what Hollywood might show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's there's often a portrayal of of surgeon surgery uh, where that that isn't the case uh, in Antietam and Gettysburg specifically. Um, but again, there's no actual evidence for those battles for the Confederacy running out. Seven days, there is absolutely evidence. Uh, and again, that may have been um, as John was saying. We speculate uh, that they just didn't realize quite how much they needed. Uh, it could be other supply issues. Um, who knows? Maybe the wagons just got caught up. Uh, but uh, for certain, they, they didn't have enough, and they continued to not have enough for weeks after the battle. Uh, so there was a, a serious supply issue there that we do not see repeated in either theater uh, after, after this. And one other quirk, shall we say, about the Seven Days Battles is, uh, well, not fought over a gigantic swath of territory, uh, it does happen over a greater swath of territory than really any other Civil War campaign. There, the Seven Days Battles are called the Seven Days Battles because over the course of seven days, there's more or less seven battles that happen in different locations, all very nearby. So there's a lot of people and armies and wounded folks moving around and you know wagons, I'm sure, were captured and recaptured. And so I, it's very possible that that may have played a role in supply shortages as well. Again, it's hard to know without really diving deep into it, uh, which, you know, we've done a bit more than a cursory glance, but uh, we haven't done, I wouldn't call our research exhaustive. Um, so there's probably more to, to be uncovered there. So if there are any enterprising historians out there looking for an interesting project, doing a deep dive into the medical history of the Seven Days campaign or, or the Peninsula campaign as a whole would, I think, probably produce a really interesting project. And it's worth um, noting, too, that most of the accounts that we have of um, a lack of anesthesia are union sources. Uh, there's a, a civilian who um, their, their camp is overrun uh, and she remains behind. Uh, and she reports how the union uh, tents were being used for surgery by the Confederacy. Uh, and she reports that that. Uh, those uh, patients were, were going without anesthesia. There's also numerous prisoners, uh, union prisoners, uh, who underwent surgery without anesthesia following the seven days. Um, but it is more than just that. Uh, the most notable case is uh, Lieutenant Colonel William Brandon. And this one is a really telling case because first of all, he's an officer. 
um, oftentimes officers receive better, better medical treatment uh, than the rank and file. Um, but also he himself was a doctor before the war. He wasn't serving as a surgeon. He was serving as uh, effective commander of his regiment. Um, he's shot and he undergoes uh, an amputation after uh, the Battle of Malvern Hill. And at this, uh, after this, he, he writes it down. He talks about his experience. This is something that becomes much more common in the 20th century. Um, there's a book in the 1930s. It's a collection of um, reports and essays called Doctors as Patients. And it's all doctors writing about their experience being sick or undergoing a, a, a surgical procedure or something like that. Uh, the idea that like you have more specialties, so you can say something about it. This is sort of prefiguring that. Uh, and his account, he says that the surgeon said there was no doubt of the propriety of an immediate amputation. I asked if he, he had chloroform, and he said yes, and proceeded. When I felt the tourniquet tighten on my leg, I called to him. I was not under the influence of chloroform. He said he had no more, and asked should he proceed. I replied, off with it. I supposed I could stand it. The operation was performed in an inconceivable short time, and the pain was horrible particularly tying up the arteries. So we're getting a pretty visceral picture there. I think it's also notable that this guy is a physician. Uh, this is not the beginning of the war. It's early war, but he's seen some stuff by now. Uh, and he says the operation was performed in an inconceivable short time. Prior to the use of anesthetics, uh, it's famously known that surgeons would move as quick as they could to prevent uh, the onset of shock uh, or to really traumatize their patient. Uh, so we're seeing that kind of return here in this situation where, uh, this surgeon has to move quickly because his patient is awake. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I thought that was a, an interesting point, uh, that he's an officer, he's high ranking, uh, and he's a doctor and he still goes through without anesthesia. So this suggests that it's not just the, the prisoners. They're not, you know, rationing based on allegiance, which you do see sometimes. Uh, this is a widespread problem for the Confederacy during the seven days. One other little tidbit worth noting as well in terms of how both armies were able to stay so well supplied when it came to anesthesia. I know you've spoken about this before, Kyle, in other videos on this subject, uh, is the uh, how a little could go a long way, especially if uh, they were underdosing, um, as we've, we've already kind of spoken about. But uh, talk about the amount of dosage you would need to effectively induce anesthesia, because that, that I think plays a role um, in, in this as well. Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, chloroform is the preferred for frontline use. It's actually the preferred everywhere, uh, but producing ether is a way of sort of buffering that. Um, generally, ether is being used in the general hospitals behind the lines. The medical and surgical history tells us that the average dosage to induce anesthesia uh, by ether was about three quarters of a cup. Uh, by comparison, chloroform is less than a shot glass. Uh, it's less than two ounces. So uh, this is a pretty wide difference in how much you need. Chloroform is also not uh, flammable. Uh, ether is uh, explosive. Uh, so you didn't really want that near the front. Um, ether accounts for only, I think, 14, 17% of all uh, anesthetic agents used by the North in the Civil War. If you had to stretch it, you could mix them. And we do see that sometimes, ether and chloroform getting mixed uh, just to, to stretch it out uh, to, to make it last longer. This probably happened more in the Confederacy, but we don't know. Um, what we do know, though, is that you can really cut back. Uh, you can give them very little. Um, I mentioned earlier the fear of overdosage. The first overdosage death was administered, I think, by Dr. John Snow, um, one of the um, uh, founding fathers of germ theory, uh, when a patient, a uh, Scottish patient, uh, died from only a teaspoon of chloroform. Uh, she was a teenage girl. Uh, so there is this deep fear that they're going to kill their patients, uh, and they often give less than they need to. It may have also been done for supply uh, issues. If, if you're in the Confederacy and you know that you don't have that much and you got a lot of surgeries to get through, maybe you'll give them just enough that they don't feel pain, um, but they may remember some of it.
Stonewall Jackson, that's that's the case, uh, at least that he remembers it. Uh, he, after the surgery, says that he heard uh, a beautiful song that he now realizes was the saw of the bone, the sawing of the bone. So he heard that and remembered it, which is not how anesthesia is supposed to work. And he's a general. So uh, there, there's probably intentional underdosing, uh, or at least uh, what they think is a safe amount of anesthesia to give, of anesthetic agent to give. Um, but again, we don't really know. They're not writing this down as far as we found. So as we start to uh, come to a close here, Kyle, I wonder if maybe you could talk a bit about some of the, the takeaways uh, from this research. What is this, you know, how, how does this shed new light on uh, or, you know, or shed light on the study of Civil War medicine. I mean, obviously, we've highlighted some specific accounts. I mean, that's, you know, new in that sense. But, uh, you know, what is looking at these instances of the lack of anesthesia tell us, you know, more broadly uh, about Civil War medicine? I think that it, uh, by studying these exceptions, it highlights the broader truth, at least if you're careful about, as I hope I have been, uh, as long as you're careful about illustrating that, um, that the truth is that this was a widely accepted uh, technique, that this was a widely accepted procedure, um, and that it is an exception to have it occur. Um, it, it, uh, it can be dangerous in history when you study the margins. If you're looking too much at very niche things, if you're looking too much at exceptions, uh, you highlight those more than the actual event. Uh, and that's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm hoping that uh, this just makes the fact that, that this was not more widespread, the fact that it was uh, truly an exception, um, I hope that that underlines, that buttresses how incredibly widespread this really was, um, that it was vanishingly small in the United States and definitely uncommon in the South. Uh, so I hope that's what it does, is it reinforces uh, what we've already said. Uh, agreed on that point. And uh, that the, um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, but yes, <laughs> I, I, I very much agree with your, your statement there that by kind of highlighting these, the, the rare instances where it wasn't the case, it kind of helps fill in the gaps in the middle uh, even more, you know, more firmly as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, well, splendid. That uh, kind of brings us to the end of uh, our uh, regularly scheduled program, as it were. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. I think this is a really, really interesting discussion. And uh, thank you, Kyle, for all of your excellent research uh, on this. And thank you for, for being here with us today. Always happy to share. And remember, everybody, uh, that you can support us through memberships. Uh, that is the best way to support us, and you get some great benefits out of it, too. Absolutely. Uh, for as low as $25 a year, you get free admission to the museum for a, a whole calendar year, uh, discounts in the gift shop, access to our newsletter and uh, academic journal that we put out twice a year, uh, and my respect. <laughs> <laughs> That's my, the real selling point there. I mean, look at this face. Do you want to do you want to disappoint this guy? Absolutely. So uh, there's that. And uh, if uh, you're just not at a point where you can do that, an easy free way to support us is just hit the share button on this video, hit the like button, uh, tell your friends, share it in any groups that you're a part of. Uh, that helps us out as well by broadening the reach. So those are a variety of ways you can uh, support us. We'll be with you, uh, or I'll be with you all next week with our uh, longtime volunteer, Brad Stone. We're going to be talking about the French influence on the Civil War. Uh, so that promises to be an exciting program, and we hope to see you all next week. All righty, until then, see you later. <laughs>